The only two things to survive a nuclear war would be cockroaches and Keith Richards. How do you understand this saying? Keith Richards, a prominent member of the Rolling Stones and a counterculture figure, left a negative impression in the eyes of audiences with a series of scandals in the 60s and 70s. Notorious in the press for his romantic relationships and illegal substance use, Keith's life certainly wasn't easy. See how he overcame the troubles he created in this video. Let's get started. Keith Richards' life is marked by a series of life-threatening incidents that defy the boundaries of fortune. His survival is often deemed a miracle, and the narrative of his existence is woven with threads of tragedy that transcend the realms of ordinary mortality. Richards's odyssey through danger commenced in 1944 during the London bombings, where an infant, Keith, narrowly escaped the clutches of a Nazi V-1 bomb that struck his cot. A twist of fate had prompted his mother and him to evacuate the area, sparing them from the imminent peril. In 1965, the stage became an arena of peril, as Richards faced an electric shock from his microphone during a performance, rendering him unconscious and burning the strings of his guitar. A close call with mortality, foreshadowing the tumultuous path that lay ahead. The year 1971 brought a harrowing incident, when Richards, overcome by slumber and cigarettes, sparked a fire that engulfed his bed. The flames threatened to consume not only him, but also Anita Pallenberg, a near catastrophe narrowly averted. The fire became an unwelcome guest once again in 1973, as Richards' Redlands estate succumbed to the flames. Despite Richards attributing the blaze to a wire-chewing mouse, the proximity of danger loomed large. The 1970s introduced a nightmarish chapter when Richards encountered the darkest side of drug culture. His substances were laced with poisonous strychnine, leading to an ordeal that epitomized the dangers inherent in his tumultuous lifestyle. As time marched on, the nature of Richards' perils shifted, but remained no less ominous. In 1998, a seemingly mundane act of reaching for a book in his library led to a catastrophic fall, breaking several ribs as heavy volumes tumbled upon him. The incident underscored the fragility of life, even in seemingly commonplace activities. A tropical paradise turned treacherous in 2006, when Richards, foraging for coconuts from a palm tree in Fiji, plummeted to the ground. The impact was so severe that he suffered a skull fracture, necessitating brain surgery. The repercussions of this incident transcended the physical, prompting Richards to confront the shadows of his vices and ultimately renounce cocaine. Figure whose very existence inspired quips and stand-up routines, Richards became a living testament to a lifestyle that seemed impervious to the ravages of substance abuse. The zenith of his notoriety came in the 1970s, when Richards faced legal repercussions for the possession and trafficking of heroin. However, amidst the swirl of controversy and the looming threat of legal consequences, Richards made a pivotal decision. In the same decade that he became synonymous with the heroin culture, he chose to relinquish the drug. It was a conscious decision born out of the stark realization that continuing down that path could lead to a future behind bars. Heroin wasn't the sole substance Richards put down in his tumultuous journey. Despite maintaining that his substance use never compromised his musical prowess and expressing disdain for the notion of rehabilitation, a dramatic incident in 2006 prompted him to bid farewell to cocaine. A fall from a tree became the catalyst for a change in his drug repertoire. Over the years, Richards continued to redefine his relationship with substances. By 2018, he had curtailed his alcohol consumption to the occasional glass of wine or beer. By 2022, even the act of smoking had lost its appeal for the iconic guitarist. As he embraced the wisdom that comes with age and found contentment without his old vices, Richards, in a departure from his younger self, resisted the allure of acquiring new ones. In a candid statement to the Irish Independent, he remarked that drugs, particularly prescription ones like Xanax, 
had lost their allure, describing them as institutionalized and bland, adding, and anyway, I've done them all. Besides, Richards, with a nonchalant demeanor, recounts this peculiar incident, a tale that intertwines grief, remembrance, and the eccentricities that define his legendary persona. As the story goes, Richards, known for his unapologetic rock-and-roll lifestyle, couldn't resist the peculiar temptation of merging his father's mortal remains with his cocaine. The guitarist, in a candid interview with NME, asserted that his father, Herbert, wouldn't have minded this peculiar amalgamation. According to another version shared with GQ, the incident took on a semi-accidental tone. Richards intended to spread his father's ashes to fertilize an oak tree, a seemingly poignant and meaningful gesture. Yet, as he opened the box containing the ashes, some of them unexpectedly landed on the table. In that surreal moment, Richards decided to snort a line of dad, because in his unique perspective, it felt right. However odd this incident may seem, the backdrop of Richard's relationship with his father adds layers of complexity. According to the Irish Mirror, the father and son endured a 20-year estrangement after Richard's parents' separation. It wasn't until the early 1980s that Richard's reached out, initiating a successful reunion. Over the subsequent two decades, Richard's introduced his father to the tumultuous lifestyle of a rolling stone, discovering that Herbert could hold his own in the world of excessive drinking. By the time of Herbert's passing, the father and son had developed a remarkable bond. Their camaraderie was such that Richards felt, comfortable with the unorthodox act of snorting his father's ashes, an eccentric memorial to a relationship that had weathered years of separation and eventual reconciliation. Keith Richards possesses a childhood steeped in surprising contrasts. Long before his iconic guitar riffs, he was, believe it or not, a choir boy and a boy scout. The Guardian reveals a youthful Richard engaged in seemingly goody-two-shoes pursuits that painted a different picture of the man we know today. Richard's Boy Scout days weren't just a whimsical chapter of his youth. They imparted invaluable lessons on teamwork and leadership. Leading a beaver patrol, according to the Daily Beast, proved to be a formative experience for the budding rock star. However, even in these formative years, Hints of his future rebellious spirit emerged, leading to his eventual discharge from engaging in a fight. As a choir boy, Richards showcased unexpected talent, singing soprano and even performing for Queen Elizabeth II at Westminster Abbey, as reported by D.W. This early exposure to music in a formal setting seems to have left an indelible mark on him. The Telegraph highlights Richards's continuation of this musical legacy with a group called Jamaica's Wingless Angels, formed in the 1970s with his Jamaican Rastafari friends. Drawing inspiration from old choral hymns, chanting, and nyabingi drumming, the group creates a sparse, repetitive sound that echoes the influence of Richards's choirboy days. Anita Pallenberg's impact on the Rolling Stones' history is as tragic as it is influential. In 1965, she entered the band's world, initially drawn to non-Keith Richards guitarist Brian Jones. However, their relationship quickly spiraled into violence, prompting Pallenberg to leave Jones for Richards. The duo set up a home in London and raised three children, their union becoming a cornerstone of the Stones' narrative. Pallenberg was not merely a guitarist's romantic partner. Her influence extended deep into the band's creative process. She contributed backing vocals to Sympathy for the Devil, but her presence was not without controversy. Richards suspected her of having an affair with Mick Jagger during a film shoot, an alleged betrayal that inspired the creation of the iconic and brutal song Gimme Shelter. Beyond the music, Pallenberg molded the social circles and aesthetics surrounding the Rolling Stones. Her impact was so profound that Joe Bergman, a member of the Stones' inner circle, claimed Pallenberg was as integral to the band as Richards and Jagger themselves. Tragically, her involvement in the band played a role in sidelining Brian Jones. Yet Pallenberg's personal life with Richards was far from idyllic. 
Substance abuse marred their relationship, leading to a gradual drift that culminated in their separation in 1980. Around the same time, Richards encountered Patty Hansen at Studio 54, marking the beginning of a more stable chapter in his personal life. Their enduring marriage, spanning almost four decades, stands in stark contrast to the tumultuous union with Pallenberg, painting a complex and tragic picture of the woman who left an indelible mark on the Rolling Stones history. The legendary partnership of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, famously known as the Glimmer Twins, is a tale of rock history marked by both triumphs and tragic rifts. According to the Washington Post, the first notable fracture in their relationship emerged in the mid-1980s. Jagger's decision to pursue his first solo album in 1985 and subsequent refusal to tour the Rolling Stones' 1986 album, Dirty Work, plunged the band into a prolonged period of conflict, described by Richards as World War III. This rift reached a point where the very existence of the Rolling Stones seemed threatened. Jagger's solo endeavors, coupled with Richard's own solo album in 1988, hinted at the potential demise of the iconic band. Despite the seemingly insurmountable challenges, Jagger and Richards managed to reconcile in 1989, salvaging the Rolling Stones from the brink of dissolution. However, the truce proved to be fragile as public jabs and strategic apologies continued to mar their relationship. In his 2010 memoir, Life, Richards painted a tragic picture of the distance that had grown between them. He revealed that he hadn't visited Jagger's dressing room in decades, expressing a lack of enjoyment in spending time with his once close friend. The guitarist's memoir unveiled a darker side of Jagger, describing him as increasingly unbearable with an inflated ego during the 1980s. The Rolling Stone magazine further exposed the extent of the tension within the band. Members devised a covert method to criticize Jagger in his presence, nicknaming him Brenda or Her Majesty. This clandestine language allowed them to discuss their frustrations with that bitch, Brenda, while Jagger remained oblivious in the same room. Keith Richards' camaraderie with singer-songwriter Tom Waits is also a unique and somewhat tragic tale of artistic collaboration. Their bond traces back to Waits' 1985 album, Rain Dogs, as reported by Rolling Stone. Richards, known for his guitar prowess, contributed both guitar parts and vocals to multiple songs on Waits' albums. In 2013, the duo recorded a distinctive version of the sea shanty Shenandoah, showcasing the depth of their musical connection. The friendship between Richards and Waits is so profound that Waits once penned a tongue-in-cheek poem titled Keith Richards, in tribute to the guitarist. This whimsical piece, reported by Rolling Stone, playfully compares Richards to a fax machine, delves into the color of his urine, allegedly blue, according to Waits, and humorously likens the Rolling Stone to a praying mantis, noting that he only has one ear and it is located between his legs. Despite the apparent camaraderie, their collaboration has its share of challenges. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, Waits holds Richards in high regard but acknowledges a dynamic that often requires an adult in the room. The two musicians attempted to co-write songs for Waits' Bad As Me album. However, the process took an unexpected turn when Richards, in a somewhat demanding fashion, repeatedly exclaimed, Scribe! Waits soon realized that Richards was seeking someone to transcribe the music they had been improvising for an hour and that someone turned out to be Waits himself. Interestingly, Richards did not receive co-writer credits on the album, despite his significant contribution. He still lent his guitar skills to a few tracks, and Waits, in a nod to their friendship, dropped a reference to both Richards and Mick Jagger on the lead single, Satisfied. Beyond the boundaries of his iconic rock realm, Richards reveals a penchant for the soulful voices of Amy Winehouse and the avant-garde stylings of Lady Gaga. Notably, his admiration for Gaga extends to a nod of approval from the venerable Tony Bennett, 
a testament to the depth of his respect for both artists. While rooted in the classics of blues, gospel, jazz, and reggae, Richards breaks from tradition by showering praise upon a diverse array of modern talents. Florence and the Machine, James Bay, and reggae luminary Gregory Isaacs all bask in the warmth of Richards' commendation. Even Ed Sheeran, with his one-man band charisma, earns Richards' admiration, despite the amusing misstep of referring to him as Ed Sheeran. In a twist of irony, Richards displays a more critical ear within his own genre. Led Zeppelin is deemed a little hollow, though he affords respect to the legendary Jimmy Page. The Grateful Dead falls prey to the blunt critique of boring shit, while harder acts like Black Sabbath and Metallica are dismissed as great jokes. However, Richards's musical disdain reaches its zenith with rap, a genre he deems tone-deaf, lamenting the surplus of words with little substance. In the realm of rock and roll, Keith Richards stands as a beacon of extravagant style, adorned in loud jackets, scarves, and an array of accessories that defy convention. However, beneath the flamboyant exterior lies a tragic twist to his sartorial saga. Contrary to the assumption of a carefully curated wardrobe, Richards' style is a simple yet unconventional affair. He unabashedly raids the closets of the women in his household. The man whose fashion flair served as the muse for Johnny Depp's iconic Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies has, for decades, donned women's clothes. In a revelation that transcends the boundaries of conventional gender norms, Richards disclosed in 2016 that the majority of his wardrobe is borrowed from his daughters and his wife, Patty Hansen. Despite the seemingly outlandish nature of his attire, Richards vehemently asserts that these are not deliberate costumes, but merely articles of clothing he finds appealing. Support for this unique approach to fashion comes from Richard's daughter, Alexandra, who attests that her father possesses a rare ability to wear anything, even venturing into the realm of his wife's pajama pants, and somehow making it look effortlessly stylish. In a tragic turn of events, Richard's borrowing escapades took an unexpected legal detour in the 1970s. During a period when the band collectively sported similar jackets, ownership became a trivial matter. Unfortunately, this carefree approach led Richards into a perilous encounter with the authorities. A jacket he wore unknowingly contained pockets harboring illicit substances. The consequence was a brush with the law that forced Richards to shoulder the blame for substances he didn't even know were in his borrowed attire. Beyond the raucous stages and the rolling tour buses, there exists a facet of Keith Richards that may surprise even the most devoted fans. The rock and roll legend is a devoted and voracious reader. In a tale that diverges from the expected narratives of excess and indulgence, the Sunday Times reveals that Richard's homes in both the U.S. and the U.K. are veritable havens for thousands of books. For Richards, the act of reading served as an early escape from the challenges of his upbringing in the impoverished landscape of 1950s London. In a poignant reflection on his formative years, he once remarked, When you are growing up, there are two institutional places that affect you most powerfully. The church, which belongs to God, and the public library, which belongs to you. The public library is a great equalizer. This appreciation for the written word has transformed Richards's personal collection into a unique library of sorts. Among the shelves that line his homes, he generously lends out volumes to friends and house guests, a testament to his passion for sharing the worlds contained within the pages. At one point, Richards even entertained the idea of organizing his extensive collection according to the Dewey Decimal System, demonstrating a whimsical desire for order amid the rock and roll, chaos. However, practicality prevailed, and the prospect of training for such an endeavor was deemed more trouble than it was worth. Instead, Richards has created a system that suits his eclectic taste. His favorite books are kept within arm's reach, readily accessible for moments of inspiration or respite. The rest, 
a sprawling tapestry of literature, finds its place on bookshelves, creating an ambiance that resonates with the echoes of countless narratives and characters. In 1965, legendary Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards embarked on a luxurious journey with the purchase of a Bentley S3 Continental Flying Spur. This wasn't just any car. Richards bestowed upon it the name Blue Lena, in homage to jazz singer Lena Horne. Over the course of more than a decade, Blue Lena bore witness to the eccentric and tumultuous life of one of rock and roll's most iconic figures. Amidst the psychedelic haze of 1967, following a drug bust, Richards took Blue Lena on a transformative odyssey through Europe, eventually reaching the vibrant city of Marrakech, Morocco. Little did he know, this fateful journey marked the beginning of his romantic entanglement with Anita Pallenberg, a liaison that unfolded in the backseat of the storied car. However, the tale of Blue Lena takes a tragic turn in 1976, when Richards, exhausted and perhaps under the influence, succumbed to sleep at the wheel. The consequence was a harrowing collision with a tree, leaving the rock legend with a nose indentation from the impact with the dashboard. Despite its scars, Blue Lena continued to be an integral part of Richards' life until 1978, when he reluctantly parted ways with the iconic vehicle. The car, however, went through various hands over the years, only to resurface in 2015 fully restored, ready to tell its tales at auction. According to Auction House Bonhams, Blue Lena was more than just a mode of transportation for Richards. It was the vessel that carried the entire band to concerts, parties, and countless adventures. The car even had a special compartment designed for the discreet hiding of the Stones' contraband a testament to the rock and roll lifestyle of the era. Richards himself described Blue Lena as a machine destined for nocturnal speed, embodying an anti-establishment spirit and a pension for trouble. The rare limited edition Bentley was, in his eyes, a symbol of rebellion, a possession he was not born into, but one that embraced the wild spirit of his rock and roll journey. In the bleak April of 1971, Keith Richards sought refuge in the opulent embrace of Villa Nelcote on the French Riviera. The Rolling Stones had initially aimed to craft their magnum opus, the Exile on Main Street album, within the rustic walls of a hillside farmhouse. When their quest for such a locale proved futile, Richards, ever resourceful, stumbled upon Villa Nelcote a property with a haunting past. This luxurious haven had once served as the sinister headquarters for the Nazis during their occupation of France. Swastikas still adorned the basement walls as Richards, undeterred by the ominous history, transformed the dwelling into a peculiar fusion of backstage chaos and a hotel room on the verge of ruin. Villa Nelcody's unsettling atmosphere, compounded by its Nazi legacy, became a breeding ground for a parade of drug dealers, hangers-on, and illustrious visitors parading through its palatial rooms. The oppressive heat, damp walls, and inadequate air circulation in the basement cast a haunting ambiance, seeping into the recording sessions. This peculiar mix of elements contributed to the album's distinctive swampy sounds, immortalized in Exile on Main Street, now regarded as one of the Rolling Stones' most revered works. Yet Villa Nelcote, despite its integral role in the band's history, remains an unlikely destination for devout fans. Situated in a remote and challenging-to-access location, the villa's present owner stands as a gatekeeper unwelcoming to the pilgrims seeking to connect with the historic site. During his years of artistic activity, Keith Richards could be considered a rebellious figure. As recounted by Richards during their visit to the mansion, he and the band's saxophone player, Bobby Keys, embarked on a daring escapade. They pilfered their tour doctor's bag, a treasure trove of pharmaceutical delights, and sought refuge in one of the mansion's bathrooms. Behind the locked door, they indulged in a drug fooled odyssey, oblivious to the unfolding tragedy. Suddenly, the shrill wail of a fire alarm pierced through the haze of their private revelry. 
Panic gripped the corridor outside as people rushed to safety. Oblivious to the growing danger, Richards and Keyes emerged from their drug-induced cocoon only to witness the bathroom burst into flames. Inadvertently, they had ignited a fire that threatened to consume the iconic mansion. Richards, in his memoir, paints an even more dramatic rendition of the incident. As they blissfully navigated the spectrum of drugs, they became aware of the room growing smoky. The drapus of the bathroom smoldered, and the situation teetered on the brink of a catastrophic blazy. An untimely interruption came in the form of banging on the door, heralding the arrival of waiters and men in black suits armed with buckets of water. The two musicians, pupils constricted to pinpoints, sat on the floor, irked at the abrupt intrusion into their private celebration. In the sultry days of July 1975, Keith Richards found himself on a musical pilgrimage through the heartland of the United States. His destination was Dallas, and the route he chose was one less traveled, meandering through the smaller country roads of Arkansas in a quest to trace the roots of blues music. Little did he know that this journey would intersect with the twists of fate in a small town named Fordyce, leaving behind a chapter that would unfold tragically and then find an unexpected resolution over three decades later. While navigating the roads of Fordyce, Richards, the iconic guitarist of the Rolling Stones, was abruptly halted. The reason? Reckless driving. The consequences of this roadside encounter were swift and decisive. He was detained, incarcerated in the confines of a local jail, and charged with the misdemeanor of reckless driving. In a court of law, Richards pleaded guilty, accepting the weight of a 162 fine that would linger as a tarnished note on his journey through Arkansas. Fast forward to the year 2006, a time when Micah Huckabee, then concluding his tenure as the governor of Arkansas, sought to orchestrate a unique and unexpected finale. Huckabee, not just a politician but a musician in his own right, playing bass in his band, harbored a profound admiration for Richards. In a moment of serendipity, their paths crossed backstage at a Rolling Stones concert. In a gesture both unconventional and fitting, Huckabee, exercising the gubernatorial privilege, decided to extend clemency to the legendary rock star. As a parting gift, Huckabee submitted a formal request to the state parole board, urging the expungement of Richard's decades-old misdemeanor. In a unanimous decision, the board granted the pardon, wiping away the legal blemish that had lingered on the book since that hot day in Fordyce. The tragicomic irony was unmistakable. A reckless drive through the blue-soaked roads of Arkansas culminated in a pardon orchestrated by a fan who happened to be the governor. What do you think about Keith Richards' tumultuous life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this, and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.